In many ways, Rosemary Barquette is like the other justices on the Florida Supreme Court. She is a lawyer. She has been a judge on the lower courts. But if her legal experience has been routine, her life has not. She was born in Mexico, the daughter of immigrants from Syria. She spent the first eight years of her adult life as a nun. And now, she is the first woman on the state Supreme Court. Behind the scenes at Florida's highest court, there is something new. There is, for the first time, a woman wearing one of the seven black robes. And not just any woman, a naturalized citizen who earlier in her life wore a black robe of a different kind as a Catholic nun. A special report on the Florida Supreme Court, as reported by lawyer journalist Ray Reynolds. The Supreme Court sits in the shadow of the Capitol, largely unnoticed. But the appointment of Rosemary Barquette as the first female justice has drawn unusual attention to the court. In this report, we take a look inside the Florida Supreme Court, a look at what it does and how well it does it and to look also at how this newest, most unusual justice may affect the court's rulings. We spent a long time in Mexico, about 24. We had a big business and working and making money, and thank God for that. And all my children, Rosemary, born in Mexico. All my children almost born in Mexico. Maria Barquette and her husband, Assad, immigrated from Syria to Mexico in 1919, after they were turned away from the United States. They finally made it to Miami 24 years and 16 children later, among the first Spanish-speaking residents in a neighborhood now predominantly Hispanic. The family ran a market while Rosemary Barquette was growing up and deciding to become a nun. I went to, um, to high school at Notre Dame Academy, which was operated by the Sisters of St. Joseph, and they were a teaching and a nursing order. Um, through high school, I, I wanted to go to Catholic University and be uh, uh, an actress, as a matter of fact. They, have a, they had a tremendous theater program, and I was very interested in theater then. Then in my senior year, uh, you get to thinking about making contributions, and uh, in those days, it seemed that uh, really the only option was, uh, you know, in terms of dedicating your life was something like the convent. St. Augustine is the home of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Nuns from the order work all around the state, but the headquarters, the mother house as it's known, is here on a narrow little street in the heart of the oldest city's oldest section. It was to St. Joseph's convent that Rosemary Barquette came to make her contribution. It means you belong to a community of women religious who pray together primarily and um, minister to the people of Florida here. This order does in a variety of ways, education, hospitals, prison ministry, the elderly, what, all, all kinds of ministries. Sister Mary Victor became a friend to Rosemary Barquette, who was christened Sister St. Michael. They often were at the mother house together in the summers and they both attended Spring Hill College, a Jesuit school in Alabama. She really hasn't changed too much. She's very vivacious, brilliant. I mean, she was brilliant. We were studied, and I'm a pretty good student, but we studied hard, and she would just walk over and say, what do you think he's going to say? And next day, bingo, two, three A's. No chance of missing. I think she had a camera mind, just brilliant. No, she didn't, she never boasted or acted show off or anything at all. She was as natural as could be. But you could see she had no problem, you know, learning. 
Both sisters became teachers and taught in Catholic schools around the state. Sister St. Michael taught in St. Augustine, just next door to the convent at Cathedral Parish School. She also taught in Miami, in Tampa, and in Jacksonville. I taught elementary school primarily, all different grades, eighth grade, fourth grade. And did you I like? I don't think I ever taught first grade. Did you like teaching? I love teaching. And even though she eventually asked to be released from her vows of poverty, loyalty, and chastity, she admired the commitment of the nuns. You were exposed to a group of people that whether you agree with them or you don't agree with them, were truly uh, motivated. I mean, there is a group of people making a good faith effort to make the world a little bit better. And, uh, I but did you see some neat. futility in what they were doing and the way they were doing it? Not necessarily for them. I, I just thought there were better ways and, and faster ways to do, to do good, as, as it were. So Sister St. Michael came to see her friend and told her she was leaving the convent. She had nothing definite in mind, but she would give up her life as Sister St. Michael and resume her life as Rosemary Barquette. She would go back to the world and leave the convent behind. Trabajó un año y todo el dinero lo gasté a ella y la regresamos a mí. Her family urged her to go to law school. And so, like thousands of other women in the late 60s, she became a lawyer. When she graduated, she planned to do good as a lawyer by representing poor people. Uh, after I graduated from law school, I applied for a job with Florida Rural Legal Services. And uh, I had hoped to work for their office in Pompano. And unfortunately, the only vacancy they had available was in Homestead. By that time, though, her parents had moved to Homestead. She wanted more independence, so she applied for a job with a West Palm Beach law firm. And in 1970, Joe Farish hired her, although not without reservations. About that time, there wasn't too many women lawyers around. I had some reservations about whether she would be accepted by the judges, by the other lawyers, and mostly by the clients. The Farish firm was a far cry from a legal services office. Farish and his father ran a small but very successful trial firm. They specialized in bringing back big jury verdicts in accident cases, and they often represented the famous and the infamous in divorce proceedings. Roxanne Pulitzer, for example, was one of Farish's clients. Rosemary Barquette, fresh out of law school, began to make her mark in the firm. Uh, she got along well with people. People liked her. Uh, men liked her. Uh, Women seemed to like her too, That's which I was glad of. Because, as I said, uh, uh, I thought there was going to be some resistance, but it fortunately turned out that way. And people complimented me about having hired such a good one. And she's, uh, and she's gutsy, got a lot of guts, real gutsy. She'd rush in where others would not, you know. And did you like practicing law? I loved it. What did you do? I was primarily a trial lawyer. And uh, I, again, it, it's back to the teaching thing. Law, trial lawyers primarily are teachers. They have to explain their position to both judges and jurors and explain it in such a way so that it's understood from your perspective. I, I like that a lot. Hugh Lindsay was another young lawyer with the Farish firm at the time. Our, our practice was, was primarily uh, personal injury from the plaintiff's standpoint. And uh, so because of that specialty, we, we concentrated on, uh, on plaintiff's cases in personal injury. She, uh, she, she was just excellent at it. Lindsay and Barquette did well with Joe Farish's firm, but it was very definitely Farish's firm. After eight years, Barquette decided she wanted her freedom, and Lindsay and another lawyer left too. Frankly, as I recall it, there was a, a disagreement, at least from my perspective, of... Uh, uh, about writing down the partnership agreement. And from there, uh, three of us decided to leave. Oh, I think she's ambitious in trying to make more money in that respect. Uh, she didn't have any check writing privileges. I wrote all the checks. I made all the decisions. I decided what percentage she'd get. She was always happy with it until she left and she decided she wanted some more. 
Yeah, I, I, I think we could say that. To be kind, we would say a little troublesome. Yeah. We, we had some philosophical differences with, uh, with one of the other partners, and um, we thought it best to, to uh, go our own ways. And the differences between Farish and his three former partners did not end when they left. Barquette and the others claimed a share of a $2 million judgment for Farish against billionaire insurance man John D. MacArthur. They're still fighting that out in the courts. Uh, she's not only uh, partially wrong there, she's a thousand percent wrong there. And she's stubborn, I'll have to say that, and she's in her own uh, mind, I think she, she probably thinks she's right, but I got news for her, she's gonna lose that one. It wasn't a fee, it was a, the, the, the cause of action is a tortious interference with a business relationship, and the business relationship was our partnership. John D. MacArthur libeled and slandered me because it was personal. John D. MacArthur didn't know Rosemary Barquette from a stick in the woods. Barquette left the firm early in 1979. She practiced alone in the Palm Beach County courts for a few months, but by September of that year, she had sought and received an appointment as a circuit judge. She was elected chief judge of the circuit only four years after she came to the bench, and she was not reluctant to urge a case along or to grant summary judgment without going to trial if she thought the facts were clear. At times, that brought trouble from the appellate courts. A look at the cases that you decided while you were on the trial bench shows that at the appellate level, you were reversed almost exactly as many times as you were affirmed, sort of a 50-50 uh, reversal rate. You know, when the case comes back to you, you are interested in the reversal or the affirmance as a, you know, kind of as an academic matter. Uh, but you cannot try cases um, and be concerned that you're going to be reversed or affirmed. She solved her problems with the appellate court in 1984 by getting herself appointed to it. She served on the 4th District Court of Appeal for a year and a half. Then came a vacancy on the Supreme Court that had to be filled with a lawyer or a judge from the 4th District. It was only a matter of time before Rosemary Barquette would be presented at a Tallahassee news conference as Governor Bob Graham's appointment. The appointment was widely hailed, although some smelled politics. I think the call was for the governor, I gotta put a woman lawyer in here, who shall it be? And it's no reflection on Rosemary, it's more reflection on the governor. In other words, she was the leading woman candidate. He had to appoint a woman because he wants to get elected senator. Rosemary Barquette was officially installed as a member of the Supreme Court on November 15, 1985. Her strikingly different background was fully evident. The courtroom was filled with the usual contingent of lawyers, judges, and former justices of the court, and also with nuns, and with dozens of members of the family Barquette, exactly laughing, you're... crying, and talking and alternately in like English, Spanish, and Arabic. And also for giving my family, who love a chance to get together, the opportunity to do so. <laughs> this was more nearly a celebration than a solemn judicial occasion, and when the investiture ceremony ended, the crowd adjourned across the street to a reception atop the Capitol. They toasted the newest justice and celebrated 140 years after the state of Florida came into being the crumbling of the gender barrier on the state's highest court. Rosemary Barquette is the newest of the seven justices, so she sits on the end. On the other end is Leander Shaw, the next junior justice. He was promoted in 1983 from the Lower Appeals Court in Tallahassee. He is the second black justice to serve. Ray Ehrlich came to the court without a day of judging under his belt. He was a top-notch trial lawyer from Jacksonville. Parker Lee McDonald is probably the toughest questioner during arguments. He's been a judge most of his life. He came here in 1979 from the circuit court in Orlando. Ben Overton is a solid justice who was appointed to the court in 1974. He came from the circuit court in Pinellas County and is probably the best known of the justices nationally. The governor appointed all of those justices, but before the state constitution was changed to make the court appointive, the two senior justices were elected in a 1968 statewide election. Justice Jimmy Adkins had been a trial lawyer and a trial judge in Gainesville. 
and the Chief Justice, Joe Boyd, was a Dade County lawyer and a backslapping politician who elevated himself from the Dade County Commission to the state's highest court. Both Boyd and Adkins will reach the mandatory judicial retirement age of 70 at the end of the year. These seven judges hear appeals in all death penalty cases, they regulate the bar, and they decide most of the important questions that arise in the lower courts. For the most part, legal scholars give this court high marks, if not rave reviews. University of Florida law professor Bob Mann. And this is a pretty good, solid, dependable uh, court in general. And uh, I think that uh, it is uh, more professional, more ethical, uh, more dedicated than uh, some of the Supreme Courts from time to time uh, have been in the past. Mann says, however, that the court is not particularly assertive or prone to break new legal ground. But it is a conservative court. On balance, uh, this court is rarely first uh, with anything when you read about uh, uh, epoch-making decisions in state Supreme Courts. You rarely read about that in the Florida Supreme Court. Justice Ehrlich is generally considered the most intellectual member of the court, and he is temperate in his assessment of the court's work. I think it's uh, fairly good, and I you say, well, why are you qualifying it fairly? Uh, we are handicapped, in my view, by the sheer quantity of work. The sheer quantity of the work uh, prevents you from giving to each case the scholarship that you might want to give. Justice Adkins, probably all around the smartest member of the court, discounts talk of scholarship. Well, now, scholarship, there are two things about scholarship. One is the ability uh, to write some thesis or, or something of great knowledge. I would say that we don't have a PhD on the court, and I don't think a PhD belongs on the court. Now, the, as far as the scholarship ability in understanding the law, explaining the law, and writing the law, I think it's good. The court lost some of its intellectual firepower and its aggressiveness a few years ago when Arthur England and Alan Sundberg resigned, although Justice Adkins doesn't see it that way. He damns with faint praise. No, I was trying to think of any outstanding opinions. That they, uh, I think they were good justices. Don't, don't misunderstand me. And I think they're smart. I think uh, Sundberg is a very intelligent man, and England, I think, is a genius. Uh, I think that uh, and they have a tremendous vocabulary. Florida State University Law School Dean Sandy Dallenbert appeared often before the court until he left his law practice to become an academic two years ago. He also discounts the theory that the departure of England and Sunberg left an intellectual void on the court. I have to tell you that I'm one of the people who, who predicted that there would be, and I, and I think I was wrong. Uh, I clearly think that they, uh, when they came in, they brought a, a freshness, uh, an energy, a uh, concern for a range of matters uh, that was, uh, was just was a happy time for the courts. And so I, I think about that period as a very important uh, period in Florida Supreme Court history. But I, uh, I, if, for people to say that the uh, intellectual void in the Florida Supreme Court uh, is to me to say that they've not been over there very much to hear what's going on. I think the court now is as strong as it ever has been. And stronger by far than it was in the mid-70s when the court was racked by scandal. Two justices resigned while the legislature was investigating them. Justice Joe Boyd also was investigated, but he hung on to his seat, insisting he had ripped an improper memo he received into 17 equal pieces and flushed it down the toilet. The uh, fact that I said it was 17 equal parts was a carefully intended comment. Because if you tear something into seven and equal parts, you're certainly not going to be using it yourself. So uh, I've studied a little psychology. Boyd himself was studied a little by psychologists after that episode. He was forced into taking a sanity examination, which he passed. He boasted in his next election that he was the only person on the court who had been certified sane. Boyd kept his seat, but his colleagues three times denied him a term as chief justice. Finally, in 1984, he got the job and a measure of vindication. Uh, Chief Justice Boyd has thrown himself into his job with such energy 
and has, uh, has cared so much about the whole court system that I think he's contributing uh, 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 very, very greatly to this. Justice Adkins finally convinced the court to elect Boyd chief. When they uh, passed over Justice Boyd, uh, it uh, bothered me because from that moment on, uh, some of the justices go around and politic for chief justice, and I think that's extremely inappropriate. I've never done it, and uh, I don't think it's appropriate for anyone else to do it. Justice Boyd's term as chief justice ends in the summer. Is there politicking going on now about who will succeed him? There's not any hard down politicking, but everybody wiggling around hoping to get it. Uh, so it's just been right amusing. Justice McDonald is next in line for the job, unless there's another coup. While there may be politicking over who gets to be chief justice, Justice Ehrlich says there is no politicking over cases. I didn't know how they arrived at decisions, whether they flipped coins or politicked each other. And I found, much to my pleasant surprise up here, that each one is an enclave within himself or herself. Uh, we need, and nobody discusses a case uh, except in conference. We don't politic each other. Nobody comes in and lobbies you about uh, maybe voting favorably or unfavorably on a point, uh, ever. Uh, when we get into conference, that's when we exchange views and knock heads. That's where the real decisions are made, when the court goes into conference each Monday. The conference room is the holy of holies at the court. Only the justices are allowed in the room. But they granted a one-time exception to that rule recently and allowed us to record one of their conferences. Justice Ehrlich provides the commentary on what takes place during conference. As far as I'm concerned, it's the most productive, satisfying thing on the court. It's, that's where you get collegiality. That's where you hammer it out. Uh, and and uh, people do change their mind uh, in conference. Uh, I, I've been convinced of the error of my way, and uh, it's not infrequent. You just say, look, I, I changed my mind because someone else has convinced you that their position is sounder than yours. Well, I'm, all I'm saying is that that's, that same thing could be done. Atkins has, has a, 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 an extraordinary fine legal mind and loads of experience. I, at least, I, I, when we, I always want to know what he thinks. That doesn't mean I follow him, but I value his opinion. He's taught me an awful lot just listening to him. And when we got a toughie, all eyes look to him. Well, Jim, one of the interesting things, and, and, and I'll tell you that... I don't talk unless I got something to say, or unless I'm going to challenge somebody, test somebody's premises. Uh, some of them just like to talk, and uh, most of the... Generally, I, I guess half the cases, by the time it gets to me, I just vote and pass it on, because everything's been said. Twice. How you're going to avoid favor? Assuming that he knows what he's doing. You might get a little hot sometime in conference, uh, or arguing purely points of view and not personalities. But when the meeting's over, it's all forgotten and uh, you start all over again. Rosemary Barquette has not been shy about speaking up during her first weeks in these halls of justice. Her effect on the court will be clearer as her name begins to appear on a few opinions. Dean Sandy Dallenbert believes she will affect the direction of the court. Uh, what will Rosemary Barquette do uh, that's different from what uh, her predecessor, Jim Alderman, did? And will that make some difference in the way the court uh, looks at things? My guess is that it will. Uh, Jim uh, was a person who was not likely to... Uh, to uh, uh, to look for creative uh, new ideas. Uh, he was much more likely to look uh, for a, a tradition, uh, to find uh, where the law had been settled and, and to try to keep the uh, law settled and, and in place. But Rosemary Barquette uh, will be, I think, uh, somewhat more uh, creative uh, and, and somewhat less likely to look to, um, uh, to precedent to answer questions than, than, uh, than, uh, than Jim Alderman was. Justice Adkins says Justice Barquette will make an immediate difference on some cases that were pending when she got to the court. Oh, yes, we have uh, uh, a number of cases that are quite close. Uh, just before Justice Alderman left, I opposed the idea, but as usual, I was on the losing side. Uh, 
we filed a, a large number of 4-3 decisions where uh, Alderman would have been the swing vote. He got off the court and the people filed a petition for rehearing. If the court agrees to rehear those cases, the result may very well be different with Rosemary Barquette rather than Jim Alderman participating. But whatever the difference in the votes, Justice Adkins says it won't make much difference that she's not a good old boy. Uh, frankly, to me, it's just another judge, although uh, uh, everybody's uh, impressing me and everybody else with the fact that she's a female, but we, we look upon her just as a fellow judge, you might say. Will it make any difference in the way the court operates? Oh, no, I don't think it will make any. I told her I'd have to clean up my language a little bit in conference, but she assured me that that wouldn't be necessary. But Justice Ehrlich, the courtly Southern gentleman, has cleaned up his language. I can't help it. I, I'm a product of my environment. I, I, it's just I don't use profanity or in front of women, or just by nature. That gentlemanliness may cost Justice Ehrlich a few laughs, though. He usually has a new joke, and it's usually off color. <laughs> well, I like good stories. I, I do, and uh, it's, it gives you a good belly laugh occasionally. And uh, if uh, Justice Barquette uh, says that she wants us to carry on like we did before, I probably would venture forth with a story or two uh, to test the waters. But until that time, I am not going to do it. The fate of Justice Ehrlich's jokes is still in doubt. But there is little doubt that Rosemary Barquette is going to make a difference on the Supreme Court. Her predecessor, Jim Alderman, was the most conservative judge here, across the board. Her background and her record suggest she will be less conservative, perhaps much less conservative. No one knows yet how she will rank in the pantheon of the great and the not-so-great Florida judges, but her place in the history books as the first woman on the Florida Supreme Court is hers alone now and forever. Thank you.